And it's not huge, about forty to three and a half feet high, forty a bit more than a metre high. And it's in the natural area of London. And this is I mean this is pretty conservative for, for Bruegel in a lot of ways, and it may actually be a again we don't have documentation, a commission uh, for an altarpiece of oh, you know, not huge like a, a real altarpiece, but uh, big enough. So he's sort of got to be on his best behaviour, you might want to say. Uh, and it's about as close as he is ever going to get to the monumentalized, idealized Italian Renaissance type figures, which is uh, you know, basically he's, he, he's, it's hard to tie him into kind of any traditional schools of art. Yeah, but he seems to take a very non-intellectual view of the world somehow. Uh, but this is uh, again, it's, it's a when you, when you see something like that, when you see some of these extraordinary figures, who, I mean, if Mary stood up, she'd be really in a lot of trouble, I think, because she's got this rather attenuated body. And, and what's happening in, in Italy at this time, the prevailing style is mannerism, without showing examples of that. Um, but for, there's a famous picture by Tendi called Parmigianino called the Madonna of the Long Neck, but it could be the Madonna of the Long Everything because she's really stretched out in an extraordinary way. And basically what you're doing is you're breaking the rules of the high renaissance of people like Raphael with correct proportions and idealized figures. Because, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, like the Protestant Reformation, like things like the sack of Rome in the 1520s. But there's traumatic events happening. You can't keep trotting out the well-behaved pictures. I mean, art should somehow respond to the times, basically. So, is, is this mannerism? I mean, I don't know. The mannerism was as strong in Northern Europe as it was, uh, almost more so in Italy, eventually. Um, and, and, but but I, I don't think, see, again, you're sort of putting labels on the Bruegel that I don't think are really that appropriate. So, uh, I think he's just being Bruegel still. But it's absolutely, again, we sort of zoom in, we've got this almost rather claustrophobic space with the uh, the ruined stable with the animals in the back. Absolutely splendid Caspar, yet again, almost lost in his robe. Very like that boshy kind of outfit that he wore. Uh, lo lovely shoes and spurs and things there. Because he is a king, remember, so he sort of wears appropriate uh, trappings. It's pretty splendid Christmas present. And then the other two, again, that we've seen is sort of middle aged and the el very elderly. Uh, Christ child, a little bit kind of uh, not that keen on what's going on. Uh, but the extraordinary thing is about this that, that um, I mean, who, you never get soldiers hanging around at, a, at, a, at an adoration scene like that. I mean, they could be sort of part of the retinue of the three kings, but they seem to be rather an ominous presence hemming us in as if there's sort of no escape running out in the back of the picture. Uh, the other thing that strikes me as being a bit strange is that. See, there's Joseph, looking quite grand, but somebody is whispering in his ear as if he's trying to sell him naughty French postcards or something. It doesn't seem to, I mean, it's sort of a bit distracting, isn't it? So, I mean, I'm sure Bruegel knew what he was doing, and he had some sort of a, a meaning for it. Uh, but it's just, again, sort of, I mean, it's all up at the front of the picture now. There's no depth, there's no space, there's no high viewpoint. I mean, it's actually a high-ish viewpoint looking in, but, uh, I mean, we don't go off into the million-mile distance somehow. Uh, but it's very recognisable, uh, and, and again, I think particularly that splendid figure of Caspar is quite striking. But also odd in a way is the, 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 this thing. I mean, again, it's almost caricaturing. Uh, there's some sort of exaggeration of the features there. And in fact, Bruegel did a number of character studies. I mean, if you want to sort of think ahead a little bit. It's almost like Van Gogh doing all those, you know, those what are going to end up as potato eaters somehow in that. And it's absolutely sort of down to earth, simplified thing. And apparently there were a few of these. I'm not quite sure how we know that, but this is the only one that survived. So look under your beds when you get home and if you find an old lady like this, we'll talk. Man, that what it means. I mean, the, the, a, lot of, see, the, a lot of the reason for this extraordinary high prices for most of these artists now is there's not that many left in private hands, so if anything does show up, there's a, you know, there's, it's all supply and demand, really. Uh, anyway, so it's rather good, isn't it? Very straightforward, very um, a, a direct, un, unjudgmental, if that's the right word. Uh, just what you see is what you get kind of thing.
And again, as a, as a caricature isn't really the right word for this at all. This is very perceptive stuff, and investigating different human types at some point. And the same sort of thing happened. He's a, he, I think he's a terrific face here. And what he is, he's a detail out of a painting called The Parable of the Blind. And again, we're sort of getting a rather different format, sort of fewer figures, less landscape, more focus on what's going on at the front. Uh, this is uh, 1568. And it's actually it's a, it's a little bit wider than we've seen up now. It's about 61 inches wide, not quite three feet high. So uh, a slightly different format. It's actually in Naples, just to be different. And what this is, it's an illustration of a passage from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the first, from Matthew, Mark, and John, you've all read that by now. Uh, if the blind lead the blind, they shall fall, both shall fall into the ditch. So, and that's again like the, the Netherlands proverb, you know, the blind leading the blind is still quite a common saying somehow, if, you know, some, mostly on sort of an intellectual level, if you, the, just the stupid leading the stupid, basically. Uh, we see an awful lot of that nowadays. So here they go, this wonderful procession of characters, each, you know, none, and, and I think the point is that they, they aren't just physically blind, they're spiritually blind, because they're, there's a big church in the background, obviously they can't see it, so they're sort of, you know, that's unavailable to them. So here they go, all sort of one hand on top of the one in front of them, and then eventually here they go and get their all, they can't see them, the lips coming up. And I mean, it's really quite uh, nicely knitted together as a, as a, as a uh, just the composition uh, of tying them together. Lovely big old clunky feet and everything. But as we see, figures getting much larger in the frame, focusing in on them, on more individuals. Uh, than anything else, but I think treated with really great compassion, with a sense almost of, of pity uh, for those who can't place their faith in the true religion that you see in the background, <coughs> with the spires sort of pointing straight up to heaven. I found that, that, that that's right. I like it when people make statues out of paintings, uh, and for some reason I think that's in the Hague, which is nothing to do with Bruegel at all, so I'm not quite sure it's there. But actually, it was, no, it's this chappy here, he sort of saved my bacon, well, not saved my bacon, but remember, uh, uh, when I did undergrad at McGill, part of the final exam was the guy who sit there, and he had all these, uh, like, flashcards, and he'd sort of hold up things, one out, and he had to say, Rafa, uh, and identify them as quick as you can. And, and, and he, he held up this picture, and I, I, mean, I can't really do any art, but I used to do drawings of bits and pieces, just I found that was a good way to rub them into the subconscious. You might even try that, just take details of pictures and copy them because your artist, that will kind of reinforce them. So anyway, I'd, I'd done a, a, a drawing, I just thought, thought that face of the chappy there was rather good. So I'd done a, quite, quite a bit of detailed drawing of that. So when the, the teacher sort of holds up the, the flashcard thing, I said, oh, it's Bruegel, blind leading the blind. And then, and then I said, oh, oh hang on, hang on, I don't, that, it's, no, it's not. Because that face wasn't quite what I remembered from having done the drawing. I said, it must be Peter Bruegel the Younger his copy of his father's uh, painting, and the teacher he just fell out of his chair, he said, I've been doing this for 40 years, you know, <coughs> this is my trick question at the end of the year, the only person who has ever caught me out, uh, and I thought, pretty smart, <laughs> didn't do me much good in the long term, but anyway, but it, I mean, it is a good sort of little learning tool to do little, little drawings rather than just sort of looking and then you forget too easily. Anyway, uh, another one which is sort of close in, uh, close up of a, of a large scale figure, and don't worry about some of these individual ones because they're just interesting but not hugely important. Uh, but it's called uh, the peasant and the bird nester. So again, this is a kind of Netherlandish proverb, which is isolating one rather than having 118 other ones as well. Uh, and again, it's about it's in Vienna. It's about it's not even quite two feet high, so really quite small. And there's an old saying saying, he who knows where the nest is has the knowledge, he who steals the nest has the nest. <laughs> Those are words to live by. So what's going on here is that the sort of the, the peasant chap in the foreground, again, very large, kind of a chunky fellow, uh, points backward, and he's got sort of rather a smug expression on it, says so point backwards up to the fellow who's stealing the nest. Uh, you can see that up there. And Basically, what was, I mean, which is the better way uh, of living somehow? Uh, the virtuous goody-goody peasant here, or the thief who's at least doing something, rather than just being smirking about it somehow. 
because uh, for sure he's actually falling out of the tree, he's going to break it in. again like a little uh, children's game sort of thing. Uh, but so as you see this chap, he hasn't noticed because he's so busy telling us about the guy in the tree, he hasn't noticed that it's like, a bit like the blind leading the blind, he hasn't noticed the big pit in front, so he's going to fall into that in a second as well. So uh, he'll come to a sticky end uh, too. Uh, the symbol, I mean, there are flowers in there, you can't really see all that well there. are. There's an iris, which for some reason in this context symbolizes man strengthened by persecution. And don't ask. The bramble, which is like thorny things, and it is, that's overcoming life's temptations. This very sort of deformed willow tree there, not doing very well at all. That basically symbolizes human weakness. So you can sort of add on little bits of that, but you're not getting the endless amounts of double meanings of. of things that we saw in many of the, the earlier works. But it's this kind of thing that uh, led Bruegel to get the nickname Peasant Bruegel. Uh, his, his two sons, I, mean, I never remember, uh, well, Jan Bruegel, he was called Velvet Bruegel, not because he painted on velvet, but he, he dressed nicely or something. Uh, so they all got their own nicknames. But, but Peasant Bruegel is not a peasant himself, it's just that he's awfully good at peasant scenes. I think that's really how the name stuck. And the two most famous peasant scenes are the wedding banquet, this one, and the peasant dance. And they're, they're both in Vienna, they're both about 1567, and we're back to that sort of fairly standard size of uh, just under four feet by just over five feet wide. And again, what, I mean, that's helped I mean, I have a little bit of art history. Is, uh, on this scale, which is big, uh, no other artist had ever treated themes like this uh, and given such kind of grand scale to the lower working class. If you were going to show peasants at all, you I mean, even write back the, 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 the manuscripts, you know, the snooty. Look at the stumbling, bumbling, mumbling peasants. You know, we look down on them. And here is just the wonderfully. Um, accurate views, one would think, of actual peasant life. And, I mean, as I said, they're quite big, but you look at it in the end, I think I took that shot, a little bit blurry, but they're almost, because they're in these huge palatial rooms. The, uh, the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna is one of the grandest of all the galleries built. Actually, this is a good thing, I think I mentioned this before for some reason, the, uh, the, the Ottoman Turks invading Vienna, 1683 was the last besieging. Once the Ottoman Turks had gone away, there was no more danger. They knocked down the walls and they had this wonderful circular route around the city with just sort of empty. Uh, so that's when they put up buildings like the, um, the Parliament buildings and palaces and palaces of the arts, this sort of thing, the Kunsthistorisches Origin Museum. And there's an equally grand building right opposite, which is the Natural History Museum. It's just an, an amazingly sort of pompous stuff, late 19th century. Uh, and that's the trouble in a way that, that, that you know the, the building almost overwhelms the art to a century. But there there are a couple of rooms just filled non-stop rivals. Uh, but they do get a little bit lost in the bigness of it. At least they don't hang them up to the ceiling, or you wouldn't get to see anything. So what we're looking at here is that well, one of the, there's, there's very few actual anecdotes about Bruegel. Again, nobody really bothered to write anything about him. But he did apparently have a friend called Hans Frankert, who you don't have to worry about. And he was a merchant. Because Bruegel, I mean, he did have intellectual pals. I mean, Mercator, who did maps, was one of his close friends, apparently. So these are the smart people of, of the day that he's hanging out with. Uh, but apparently he, Bruegel, and Frankert uh, used to crash wedding parties. And just they just sort of go and all were friends of the groom, whatever you know, and then they sort of go. And then so this is sort of first hand knowledge, sort of investigation of what's going on here. And again, what you can see is large figures filling the frame. Now I was in much, much lower viewpoint. We're almost sort of down at you know a tabletop level looking across. This wonderful diagonal that pulls you right in along uh, the composition. And just the sort of the energy of what, I mean, this was another, I just, I thought this was a, I love this guy here, this is another chappy I did a drawing of, just sort of turning around and grabbing, you see this is a door, it's got the hinges, I mean they're using that as the, the trolley venue to bring in this disgusting looking food that they're having, 
and he's, he's picking one up. He's not looking what he's doing. He's, not, he's going to spill it in a second. So, I mean, it's not significant. It's just a little sort of slicer. But it's a wonderful sense of energy up through the figure over to there. And all of, see, the, the, this is the, the wife, the blushing bride. The husband, for some reason, the husband doesn't get to be in this part of the ceremony. Uh, he might be outside collecting money or something, gifts. Uh, but she is there, the, the sort of the, the idea of the blushing bride, uh, who is, I mean, she hardly gets 10 out of 10, does she? So that's uh, rather unkind. I mean, she's not conventionally pretty fine. Uh, and also, the thing about her head, the sort of crown, which was a symbol basically of her virginity, is kind of tilted a bit. So, again, that might be a little jokey comment on, uh, on her purity. And again, sort of, I mean, these are all sort of fertility symbols, things like that in the back. And see, basically where we are, we're just in a big bar. I mean, couldn't they just cleared out all the the straw and everything and then, then put in these trestle tables and everything? Uh, all being down to the tune of the bagpipes. We all know what that means. And so that can't be a good thing at all. And see, this is, he's, he's always looks a tiny bit different, this chap. And there's um, Christ. First official miracle is when he's at a wedding and they run out of wine and he turns water into wine, which is probably the most useful miracle he ever did, apart from bringing people back to life. Um, so that almost looks like they're doing that there, but it's just the idea of, of, of um, then sort of the feast of plenty in a way. But also, is it all is it also gluttony? Because we've seen, you know, one of the seven men, anything to do with overindulgence and overfeeding. I mean, we don't really need all this food, so we just kind of... And then everybody is rather obese, uh, so that's not good. Uh, how do we ever... And the, the big question is, how do we ever get to be so stupid? Uh, we learn from our olders and betters. The little kid on the floor here who's stuffing his face, and he's wearing his daddy's hat. And the hat has the peacock feather, which is a symbol of pride, of vanity. But again, one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, and there's, a, there's an interesting sort of an extra foot. I'm not quite sure if you can attach that foot because that, that's his foot, that's his foot. So who belongs to that one? Uh, there's a, because I'm, I'm just thinking ahead, Vermeer I'm doing next, there's a famous picture that he does, that is, of the, it's called the the art of painting, it's got a number of types of painting. There's a painter sitting with some of you may know, a painter sitting with his back to at the easel, and the easel doesn't have its third leg, which is but it's paint and uh, all that. So don't worry too much about the extra foot. But people do get curious about that. Now see there's one other thing here that because these are all sort of nice peasanty types going all the way along there, and they're, they're sort of you know recognized I mean, it's chugging booze like that, that's gluttony right there. Uh, and, but look you look at this this chappy here it seems to me to be totally different with his sword. You shouldn't bring your sword to a wedding anyway, maybe. And he looks a little bit different. I think he's sort of that way. But these two, it's handy to keep your spoon in your hat as well. That's good. Uh, and, but see, but look who's next to him. There's a monk, and he's got his hands clasped in prayer. It's almost like he's, he's making his confession to the monk. We've seen that little idea before. But he looks very, very portrait-like, doesn't he? I mean, totally different from everybody else in the picture, really. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's Bruegel's friend Hans, Hans Frankert, the one who he crashes the wedding, weddings with, sort of begging forgiveness for because he shouldn't be there. It just, it's a little thing that's always struck me as being a bit different. I've never, to be honest, I've never bothered to read about these things much because they're sort of just nice to look at rather than learning a whole lot about. But anyway, that's that one. I thought that was that one. For, does, who, who, What's multi-reclaim? It looks like it's a coupon. Do you think for, for Bruegel, it's sort of a little joke on Burger King, but it looks like you could get a discount if you printed that out. What, what's Paris in your year? What's the date? The date is uh, 1525? Yeah, well, that's, that's Bruegel's date. Oh. It's 1525, and the dating is 1568. So I guess it's probably run out by now. This coupon. What language is that, though? Is it Polish or something? I thought we had every international nationality represented here. I guess we missed one. It's not Polish. It's not Polish. Okay, that's 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 good. That eliminates that. German. No, it's not German. Well, that, well that's that's coincidence. That's the art gallery, but that's in German. But this isn't German. Anyway, we'll worry about that another time. So
So this is the, this is the companion fit, and they were obviously painted to go together, uh, which is even that's a newish idea, is to have a, a sort of um, parallel pictures, if you like. So this is the dance, uh, where again the bagpiper is absolutely pro prominent. This totally disreputable looking fellow here with the equally disreputable friend with his peacock feather hat and his big jug of boots. Again, how do we get to be so stupid? Our mummies teach us how to dance, or, you know, the, as they all sing, so the young Twitter, that kind of idea. Tons of overindulgence. Ooh, bit of snogging going on over there. That's okay, right. We're going a bit more. That's, that's good, snogging there. Yeah. Whoa. Um, and... Oh, wrong way. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. And, and so, again, it's all about riotous living and all sort of good, jolly good fun things like that. Uh, in, in the... Um, I mean, you can, almost, you can almost feel the ground shaking as the couple here go thundering in to join the dance, and everybody's sort of yeah, capering around. Capering is a good word for this sort of dancing. Uh, and, 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 but again, the, the moral message essentially is, because again, of course, with the magpipes, you're going down the slippery slope, basically. But, but, but also, look what's happening is, is up on the tree. Uh, just to the right-hand side, there's actually a little cheapo, little shiny thing of a Madonna and child image, it's sort of a coloured woodcut with a couple of little wilted flowers on it, but nobody's paying any attention to that. In fact, in the background is the church, and nobody's paying any attention to that, so they're sort of the rejecting the, the true good life for just instant fun. Again, spoons and hats, that's always a good one. Uh, I'm just looking to see, because usually... Well, there's a, there's a fellow being dragged into the house here by this naughty woman. There's usually somebody peeing in the background. Well, maybe not here. Um, and, and that's got to be something there, that particular banner outside. It's sort of the pub sign, basically. But anyway, it's all about, again, it's all, all over indulgence. But as I think I said last time, the phrase not specifically attached to Bruegel is that there's more gusto than disgust, so there's sort of enthusiasm. You're almost thinking that, it, you know, you may go to hell, but it might be worth a shock somewhere to do that sort of thing. And this is, see, this is an example of Peter Bruegel the Younger, uh, and it's, again, he's not nearly such a good artist, it's certainly not nearly as original, uh, but he's, he's, he's very popular. I mean, his, his paintings now, the, the better ones, go for millions of dollars, that's sort of what we've come, come to. Uh, and, and, and what he does, in a sense, is combine the, both seeds together, the inside and the outside, if you like. So we've got all the figures prancing around in the foreground. And there's, I don't know, there's going to be 15 versions of this, at least. There's one in the AGO, but I'm not sure if it's actually hanging this down. Uh, I haven't been in there for a little bit. And, and normally the men have enormous card pieces. Sometimes they're sort of, you know, oil, oil, oil. Uh, And sometimes they've been sort of painted out a little bit, too. Like more bagpipe playing, of course. What the, the blushing bride here is, is actually collecting all the gifts. Because when you showed up to the wedding, you had to, well, they still do, obviously, you know, and then, you know, that's, so she's collecting the stuff. I still don't know where the husband actually is. Uh, and there's lots of chugging of the boots. See, these, they're, they're so many peeing. I mean, he, that isn't, that's, I know peeing when I see it. That, those are definitely peeing there. Uh, and so all of the bad behaviour, all of but now outdoors it's rather a nice little landscape without all the, the fathers, lots of snogging and swooching and good stuff going on over here. And this odd fit, look at this chap, he's totally dark, gloomy, out of place, he's just not having any fun at all whatsoever. And he's basically the, the kind of moral conscience, if you like. Again, the warning that these people are enjoying themselves just a little bit too much. So hell will be their reward, all of that. And so he's the party pooper. But nobody's ignorant, everybody's just ignoring it completely, so that's all right. Now these are, these are the last ones I want to finish up with Bruegel to show you these things, because they really are quite extraordinary. Uh, and and um, the, I, should, I, should, I forgot to point out that the, Bruegel, the younger, Peter the younger, uh, he was five when his father died. Uh, no, I, th I think, was he called Hellbreugel? Oh, no, he was called Hellbreugel because he did a lot of uh, sort of last chapter of time scenes. Uh, and then Jan, the other side, the older son, I think, he was uh, uh, so the, the, the friend of Rubens. Uh, but 
I mean, to, to, I mean but Bruegel himself, I mean, if, you, if your father died when you're five, you're not going to actually learn very much from tutoring wise. But I think, again, it was uh, Bruegel's wife, the daughter of his teacher, who probably was involved. Uh, there was certainly a woman, it might have been even Granny, who taught the younger generation how to paint. Uh, so anyway, they're not, they're not nearly on the grand scale of, of, of people they are, they are. But these are the ones which really are quite, uh, quite unique, quite extraordinary. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if you would call these actually sort of moralizing. They're certainly not the busy, busy ones that we saw earlier on. Uh, but they are really quite magnificent. And, and again, there, there are, remember, again, all the way back to the beginning, the, the tray we show of the Duke of Berry, the, 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 the months, the calendar of the months, one scene per month. In this case, you've got six paintings. So you sort of two months per picture with a slight you know, argument on exactly what months are being illustrated. Uh, and the, again, so that sort of standard size, 46 by 64 inches, uh, 1565 to 60, 56. Four of them are in Vienna. This one here, which is called The Harvesters, is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. One of them is in, where is it, in Budapest? No, in Prague, which is another sort of Habsburg stronghold. Uh, and one of them's missing. So again, go home, look up the internet. There's actually not a bad novel, it's called Headlong, uh, about a fellow who finds the sixth one, and there's all sorts of interesting things happen along the way. Uh, if you like that sort of thing. Um, but again, you, see, you have to have a little bit of art history looking at these things because, uh, I mean, apart from within the manuscripts where they would be fairly standardized as calendar illustrations, basically, uh, these are, these are one-off things. He's sort of inventing the art of landscape painting. And as I said earlier, that, that sometimes I think, you know, you've got the flight of or something, gradually they disappear and you get nature itself being celebrated. In this case, the justification in a way, it are the sort of labors of the months, or the labors of the two months. But there's still, you know, you don't have the benefit of biblical story. I don't I mean, you can look all over it, you're never going to find a donkey with a lady on it, I don't think. Uh, if you do, I'll get mad, because uh, that will spoil my argument. Uh, if this is just about the world that you can see and understand uh, around you, but they are very grand statements about the nature of nature itself somehow. They have nobody done that before. Man's place within nature, again, okay, within the seasonal adjustment to the forces of nature, working together with nature, that kind of, uh, again, this is sort of country men who, who understand this sort of thing rather than city folk, perhaps. Uh, so, as I say, the set of six painted for, again, the idea of new patriot, an Antwerp merchant called Nicholas Jongelink. I have to spell him. Uh, don't worry about the name, but J-O-N-G-H-E-L-I-N-K. J -O -N -J -J -O -N -E who, who apparently owned lots of other bridles as well, so you, know, you need to have a, a was a sponsor, a patron, just to uh, keep going. Uh, anyway, the series, had, as I say, completed probably by early 1566. Now, we're sort of back to the earlier style where we've got a pretty high viewpoint. We've got this wonderful panoramic view uh, of nature. Uh, but, you know, the, fi the figures are mostly foreground, and then the, 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 the spread of the, the grandness of the created world goes off into the distance. There's a sense of real atmosphere of the lights and the darks and the, you know, the times of day, the seasons themselves that are brought out here, which is really uh, quite wonderful. Uh, so what we see, just fairly briefly, that the, the harvesters toiling away in the heat of the, of the summer. This is probably August, September when you do your harvesting, and they're done well. Look at the height of the corners are high as an elephant's eye, whoever said that. And so it's hard labor, and, and so, Again, you sort of combine forces, if you like, with nature. You know, to, even the fact of, of sowing seed is a wonderfully optimistic thing. Because here you've got all this wonderful stuff in your hand that you couldn't make bread out of right now. But you throw it away, you toss it onto the ground, and you sort of assume, you hope, you pray that in four months, whatever it takes, you'll get something up here that you can, you can harvest nicely. Now, this, this grouping of figures under the tree is there, there are actually other 
illustration with this, these kinds of people, and they all illustrate sloth, laziness. Because they're all they're all flaked out, and again, there's a little is that glutton eating chuck chuck there? Not really, because in this context they've been slaving away, that they they've earned, they deserve to have some downtime, to have a nap. You know, you're dying of thirst, so it's not really gluttony, it's just kind of refreshing your bodily fluids and things. And they're not really overindulging, they've got some, again, the usual sort of rather disgusting stuff that they're slurping away here. I love the group of particularly the women in the background who are just stooping over, uh, piling up the, the, the corn into these sort of stoop thingies here. Uh, others all the way into the back. There's fruit coming out of the tree. I'll show you a couple of these in a minute because there's actually a chap that are at the tree shaking it down. But this is all sort of God's rewards, if you like. It's almost, uh, it's almost like a Garden of Eden where God said, you know, you've got everything you want, just pick it off a tree, whatever, just not that tree. Uh, and then it's all sort of divinely ordained because in the background is the church. So this is kind of, it's sort of slightly hidden, but it's still God's world, if you like. He's, he's running the show. And down in the village here, there's this lovely harbour scene down here with another church and sailing boats in the harbour. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's a, a kind of, also sort of peaceable kingdom in a way, with everything working nicely in together. And I love the idea of like, you know, the heat of the day, you put your, your flag and your big jug of wine in the corn itself just to keep it slightly cool away from the heat of the sun. And the way that the figures come scything along here, there's a lot of a rhythm, the way they're just sort of chopping down there. And it falls to the ground here, flat, and then the ladies come along and pick it up, and, you know, they bundle it and do this too. And then uh, they walk down through the fields with stuff on their head, you know, they put it on their head and they walk down. And they, I mean, you want to see a hay wain? We saw that with, with uh, the biggest wain you've ever seen in your life there. So again, it's all bountiful and fruitful and things like that. Uh, and it's so slightly color coded now, we're going off into the distance. But again, you get a real sense of the the grandeur of God's work. Now, some of the these are just me in the Met, just going click click with my long best camera. You can see the chappy there, uh, sort of throwing down the fruit. Uh, this chappy, you know, he's coming up through, just sort of get reinforcements. Maybe take it to other workers further down. I'm not sure if I can see it much. Uh, yeah, see, there's the ladies just with the things over their heads as they're walking. In. And the details in the village. There's, see, there's there's the way the huge wagon there. Uh, but there are, again, there are people, oops, people skinny dipping in there. It's just sort of nice little village, village life stuff going on. And I mean, even the fact you've, you've scared the birds up from the fields as you're, as you're walking through, they'll come from. And, and what, just, if I can see that, there's actually, and we saw this with the, even with the limbo brother, there's actually sort of flowers growing up within the wheat itself somehow. That's rather good. And then there's another little detail that's the little pond, and they're cooling off it. Now on this, it's, 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 it's a bit fuzzy, I remember. Now that's the pond, and this is, yeah, you see, you can't really see it. There's a, it must be a really popular game, because you see, over here, there's a fish dangling on a stick, and you get to throw stuff at it from over here, so if you hit the fish, you get a point. And, uh, again, sort of the equivalent of pong. Uh, and, I mean, it's just, it's all, I mean, all these lovely houses, this deep roof, I mean, it's just so real and everything. I mean, it's not quite so real for us, obviously, because it's, you know, it's 300 whatever it is years old. So for us, it's a history lesson. But imagine back then, particularly if landscape painting wasn't a factor in art, because nobody else had done anything even remotely like this before. And suddenly you get to see a sort of uh, a celebration of your own recognizable world in a fairly grand size of painting. It'd be good stuff. As I say, if you don't, a little bit of art history is, is handy to know that these, these are the first examples, really. Uh, and then and then and one like this, which is, uh, this is gloomy day or dark day. You'll sometimes see it called. Um, possibly March, somewhere around that time. So we're kind of moving into spring, but it's still sort of fairly troubled uh, nature stuff. Uh, but in the foreground, uh, you can actually sort of see new life growing there, pollarding trees. I'm not quite sure why you do that, but that, this is all about... It. And there are also the people sort of capering around a little bit here, and they're, they're dancing. Away. But that, you see, again, in this context, that's all right, because you're sort of celebrating this is sort of rites of spring stuff that's going on. So that's okay. You're not going to go to hell anymore for that. But still, when you look into the back, there's this amazingly 
wild background. And again, you've got again the sort of warning sign, if you like, like the uh, the, the foundering ships, the, the, the stormy seas, the cloud, this wonderful silhouetting of the trees, here. and the landscape itself, which again is nothing like like anywhere near Antwerp or Brussels. This is all alpine stuff that he would have seen passing through and been inspired. Just something stuck in the back of his mind, basically, that was absolutely wonderful uh, to see in this in, in sort of great distant panorama as he's traveling all the way across it. And the other one, which is a little bit similar, um, I'm not even, this might be more sort of more fall time rather than spring time. But again, this hugely broad view of nature as we travel, but there are still, you see, there are, there are gallows and things. Mm, that's not good. Um, and and the, sort of the bigness, the vastness of nature spreading off the million mile distance, that sort of thing. Because I mean, it's not really until you get to somebody like Claude Lorrain in the 17th century that I don't think there's anybody doing the nature with a capital M like this. Uh, you know, as I say, it's not specific stories, it's not moralizing. Yet there, there's almost as much kind of religiosity in these images as there are in actual pictures with, with holy people in them. Uh, and this is again the lovely silhouette, you're slightly ominous looking about, but this is, this is this is called the return of the herd. And, and it's again it's, it's the idea is that you know it's the end of the day, everybody's absolutely exhausted, you're coming back to your little villagey area with you know you're cold, you're wet, you're miserable. Uh, but still a kind of vitality in nature, I think you'd have to say. Uh, and and, and not terribly polite, all these cows' bottoms that are pointing out towards us, but that's okay, we're sort of heading down the slope into the little village here. So again, this is, uh, you know, you're talking about the hardship of life, but still, again, that kind of um, work, working in this divinely ordained world that things, you know, it, you, you kind of slave away, but you, you reap the benefits, I guess that would be the way of putting it. Nothing is easy. But it's all part of God's gift. And my favorite of the whole lot, and I did I think I flashed this up at the end of last time, just to finish off Roygal with this one, called Hunters in the Snow. And again, it's just this amazingly beautiful vista across this kind of hilly land here, again, which is not native to where Bruegel is working. I mean, there's little hilly bits, but nothing but, particularly in the background, there's rather, again, there's sort of rather fanciful, uh, craggy, mountainous end. So that has to be Alp, Alp stuff that he saw uh, when he was passing along. Uh, and, and there's people, you know, again, in a, in a sense, people uh, um, they have kind of, because they want to pin it down and sort of maps be a little bit overly political about things and, and, and you know, Bruegel's motives of painting these things. And, and you can see what, what's happening is the hunters are coming along here, the hunters in the sun, and they're staggering along, and it's never really freezing cold, of course, and they've got their rather mangy looking dogs, really mangy looking dogs, running along behind them, uh, and a little yappy dog there. And they're actually, I'm not sure how clear that is, but over their shoulders they're carrying fox tails. Uh, and this is seen as being symbolic of the fact that right about this time there's a, there's a famous sort of Dutch freedom fighter, I guess you call it, William the Silent, William of Orange, uh, who actually died, he's assassinated very, very early on in Delft. And you can still go to the place where he was killed and there's sort of bullet holes in the wall where not all of them hit him. Uh, and it's a little bit fake, but it's quite good. Uh, anyway, he's the one who initiates this war of independence sort of both politically and religiously against Spain. And one of his emblems was the fox tail. Uh, and that was, again, seen as a sort of symbol of the, the, the northern rebels, who are the ones who are eventually successful and break away and become the Dutch Republic. Uh, so, I mean, that's good. I mean, that could well be that, but even though it might be a tiny bit early, uh, but it does also fit seamlessly into the idea of the winter landscape, because, of course, this is the, uh, the time of year that you hunt and capture foxes, because this is when their pelts and their tails are their thickest and their glossiest. So this is when they're, I mean, you don't hunt a fox in June or July, because it's kind of molted and it's scrawny. Uh, so this is the time when you would go and, and, and grab them, and so your rewards are the greatest. There's a wonderful bit, again, I can't quite zoom in enough, but 
Uh, just the painting of the fire here, which looks like it's going to burn down the whole building, but it probably won't. Um, and so I'm saying that that rather difficult. But now this has to be something again. I can't quite remember what it is. If I ever knew, so the signboard is actually falling off a bit. It's got something on it, but that I mean, it's probably very significant. You can go check that out. And then you come whizzing across here. And again, if you can't beat it, join it sort of thing. You've got every kind of winter sport uh, going on on the frozen frozen pond, basically. And I mean, I'm also trying to do curling. There's a huge argument about uh, who invents golf. If it's the Scottish people or this lot, and of course, being a Scotsman, I think it's, it's Scotland. And in fact, they, they didn't know how to spell it. They spelled it with a K, so it was a complete. But they do it on the ice, and usually, you know, somebody's about to whack, whack the ball right into a big crowd of people, so that wouldn't be much fun, or a lot of fun. And then there are people just skating around. You have to get the good reproduction to, to zoom in on it all. Uh, even down here, there's somebody hauling a neighbor friend on a little sled thing on, 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 on the skids there. Uh, and icicles everywhere, just hauling you know, faggots on your head. All of this kind of real life, natural bits and bits. They really do look like they can, don't they? Uh, and there's usually holes in the ice where people are fishing and things like that. And the kids are just whizzing around on it. And I mean, it's sort of Christmas card, isn't it? I mean, it's also a little bit too cute and cosy and nice and little smoky cottages. And, but that's what you get in God's world, I guess. You're sort of under his protection uh, somehow. Uh, and then you travel off up into that. My favorite part of the whole picture is this little bird here. And it's just going, whee, across the whole expanse of the landscape. Just sort of liberation. So maybe there's a little bit of that in it, but I don't think necessarily politically against the big bad outside people. It's sort of the soul flying free somehow. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely picture. Uh, anyway, one final one just to show you to... I, 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 I mean, it's just called The Painter and the Connoisseur. And I just rather, because this is all sort of you guys, uh, with your brush and your work in a way like that. It's sort of a self-portrait, but it's kind of every artist in a way. And here's... Anybody wearing spectacles, remember, is short-sighted. And shorts are not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, whatever else. So this guy's yapping on about his stupid... And look at the expression on his face. is just one because the hairy, so this crazy artist who's been told what to do by this guy. But he's got his hand in his wallet, you see. And that, you know, that's where, you know, because he's paying, you know, his picture sort of idea. So there's a, a, a nice sort of connection between the two. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite Roy Glasher does rather lots of good drawings and prints and things that you can look at as well. He's very prolific for somebody who dies so young. Uh, but that's just a little sort of smattering. I think I've showed you most of the really good ones, the important ones, but uh, he's kind of interesting. So it's a little bit early, as I say, to break on, but I do have to run off and do two hours on Vermeer, who I'm going to call Bruegel all evening. You know. um, so anyway, remember, I, I do a midterm, some of them, if you haven't picked them up, up at the front. Uh, any other questions, please, if you email me, send a phone number, because I'm not going to, I can, I mean, my email doesn't work for reply, it won't do it. So if you send a phone number, I can just call you up, we can chat. Much better way of doing things. So uh, next, next time, don't forget the holiday on Monday, right? So next Wednesday, a week today, 